Welcome to the Manga Bay Newscast. It's August 10th, 2021, and I'm your host, Mike Gorecki, bringing you the news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline. Today we've got two stories of marine conservation, one that looks at seashells and what they can tell us about the health of the oceans, and another about the extensive marine protected area system in the Philippines, one of the world's marine biodiversity hotspots. Our first guest today is Cynthia Barnett, journalist and author of the new book, The Sound of the Sea, Seashells and the Fate of the Oceans. Barnett tells us about why she chose to look at marine issues through the lens of seashells, the long history of human interest in seashells, and what they can tell us about how climate change and over-exploitation are impacting marine environments. We also speak with Manga Bay's own Leilani Chavez, a staff writer based in the Philippines' capital city of Manila. Chavez tells us about why the Philippines' waters are considered some of the most biodiverse on Earth, the main threats to that marine diversity, and the challenges facing the country's marine protected areas, many of which are run by local communities. You know, I think it's important to recognize that ecosystems are interconnected, and not just in the marine ecosystem, but also how terrestrial ecosystems, coastal ecosystems, cities, and the marine ecosystems are interconnected. Cynthia Barnett's latest book, The Sound of the Sea, is a cultural and scientific history of seashells that gives equal attention to the mollusks that make seashells and the many ways they have fascinated and been used by humankind for thousands of years. Barnett also pays particular attention to what seashells can tell us about the state of the world's oceans and humanity's relationship with them, as the impacts of global climate change and over-exploitation of marine life become all too apparent. Seashells are certainly an interesting means through which to view all of this, so I asked Barnett to explain how the book came about in the first place. I was casting about to write a book about the oceans for my next book because my previous three books all involved different aspects of the water cycle, either fresh water or my, my most recent book was Rain, A Natural and Cultural History, and so I was, I was looking for the next book and I was invited to speak at this wonderful seashell museum in Southwest Florida called the Bailey Matthews National Shell Museum. And I went there to give a book talk and afterward I was talking to the director about a survey that they had conducted. They had surveyed visitors to find out how much visitors already knew about shells. And these are mostly tourists to Florida visiting with their children. And the surveys revealed that some 90% of visitors didn't know that a seashell is made by a living animal. Most people thought they were some sort of rocks or stones. And I was so I was disturbed by that and I, I couldn't stop thinking about it. I've been an environmental journalist for a long time and I also teach environmental journalism. Barnett is an environmental journalist in residence at the University of Florida. And I, I just, you know, I just couldn't believe the extent to which we are so disconnected from the ocean, right? And these are people who clearly love the ocean. They've, they've come to the sea for a vacation. They've come to a seashell museum. And yet they had that incredible separation from the life that builds the shell. So I started thinking about that a lot. And I started thinking what a perfect metaphor that is for how we understand the ocean itself, right? We've always loved the ocean as this beautiful backdrop of life. Like we love we love seashells for the beautiful exterior rather than the life inside. And we also love the oceans as the beautiful backdrop of life or some postcard and, you know, not really understanding that the oceans are the source of life, the extent to which they keep us alive and the extent to which they are imperiled and, and kind of what's going on beneath those beautiful waves. So all of that really came together for me in the story of seashells. And the other thing I really like about seashells for being able to tell a story and particularly to try to draw a more general audience to the story of what's happening to the oceans and to climate change 
seashells just strike me as really nice ambassadors, right? Because people love seashells. They're, they're probably the most beloved object in nature. And I, and I really am going for that broader audience. I, I feel like with my first couple of books, especially, I was often preaching to the choir. I would get invited to do a book talk by an environmental NGO or water engineers. And that's not, that's not the audience we, meet, we need to move. So I kind of started thinking of seashells as ambassadors. And, and my hope is by telling the story through seashells that I can draw broader and, and maybe new audiences to the story that we're used to telling in the, in the work I do or in the work you do at Manga Bay. Yeah, that story stuck with me too. You tell the story of that tourist survey in the intro to the book, and I was pretty shocked by it, honestly. 90% of people thought that shells are rocks or stones and didn't know they come from living animals. I was I was quite stunned too. And I actually, Mike, I didn't believe the statistic for a while. I thought I thought it must have been a highly flawed survey or a mistake of some sort. And it and it wasn't an academically published survey. It was a, you know, it was a museum visitor survey. But the longer I worked on this book, and this this book took me six years and I was I was around a lot of people, you know, who just who just love beaches and or who love seashells and who weren't necessarily, you know, again, in, environmental readers or what have you. And I really came to understand that that survey was pretty accurate. And especially in my conversations with teachers before the book came out and since the book came out, I've learned that there are a number of kids in interior Florida who grow up never even having seen the sea. And the teachers, some of the teachers already who have responded to the book have said absolutely they've met lots of kids who didn't know that a shell was live, uh, made by a living animal. So, so this is work we have to do, right? It's, it's, it, we've, we've failed somewhere and we, and we need to figure that out because we failed in these areas that, you know, it, it may seem just weird or funny when it comes to a seashell, but when it comes to misunderstanding COVID or climate change, you know, that, that is much deadlier. So um, we, we have work to do. And I thought sea, seashells are, are a way of um, connecting me to people who I may not normally be able to connect with. And that's one thing I really love about seashells as a, as a topic. You write in the book about how seashells have been used as everything from money and jewelry to horns for musical and religious purposes. Can you give us the sort of quick timeline of human interaction with shells? Yeah, so sure. I'd, I'd love to give you the human timeline. So I would actually start 500,000 years ago with some of the first art known fossilized mussel shells at the Solo River in Java Indonesia site of Java man bear these incredible geometric kind of zigzags that were engraved half a million years ago by a purposeful hand. Anthropologists say these decorated shells represent cognition among our predecessors, human er uh, Homo erectus, and some of the world's oldest known art. And I, I just love that. I love the way seashells connect us across humanity in in they connect us in deep time right they connect us in geology in the in the strata of the earth and even at the top of mountains they really helped reveal certain things about science you know from from fossilized shells that help scientists understand evolution to uh, shells on mountaintops that help them understand the shifting of continents and rising and falling seas. So I, I love that they're kind of guideposts in, in all kinds of ways and, and that they're guiding us again now, which I know we're going to get to, but 
But to go back to your question about the human timeline, I know you've started the book and it opens with me, you know, kind of imagining a Neanderthal person walking on a beach in Spain and collecting cockle shells. And, and I, open, I open with this scene because archaeologists have found, they found this incredible cache of, of shells tucked into a, into a sea cave. And they know that the shells were collected purposefully for some intention beyond food. They could tell that they were gathered when the shell was already dead or emptied and they match one another beautifully. They all have perfectly round holes in the top. And so they were, they were an intention. And the beautiful thing about that is that I remember when my kids were little, and especially my daughter, when she was five and she would walk the beach and collect cockle shells, she would do just that, right? She would, she would pick, they even kind of look like the same size as the Neanderthal shells where they're all the same size and have the same little hole in the top. In her case, she wanted them for necklaces. And there's some uncertainty about what the Neanderthal cockles were, were for, although one of them had been used as a kind of cosmetic case. So it's just lovely to think about that stretch of time and human evolution and how we might be bound in, in the beauty of this natural object. Seashells are also the earliest known keepsakes tucked into graves. So a small cone shell called Conus Ebreus was found in the grave of a four to six month old infant in a large rock shelter in South Africa known as Border Cave. And it had been notched by hand and strung onto a pendant and worn by someone for many, many years before it was placed with the Stone Age baby. So you just, you know, you just imagine a mom or a dad tucking that little shell into an infant grave 75,000 years ago. And it's just, just amazing to think about it. And, and so, yes, as you, you mentioned the, the Shabine, I, I devote a chapter to seashell trumpets and the importance they've had uh, throughout throughout human history. E even today, even today, when you go to visit Key West, there's this mournful ceremony at the end of the day when you see the when you see the sunset. They blow a they still blow a conch shell to recognize the sunset. So. All of that is, I think, moving and, and brings people to the story, right? So what I wanted to do was blend those human stories with the environmental stories, because I think too often as environmental storytellers, we might leave out the humanities or leave out some of the history or the, the, the archeology span or some of the human stories to get to the science and I think that hurts us and we're, we're better off finding that sweet spot, right, between, between science and the humanities to, to tell a story that, that can really stick. You organized the book so that each chapter deals with a different species of mollusk that creates a shell, right? Yes, that's right. And as you can imagine, it was hard to organize because like we were just talking about, you're talking about not only human history, but long before human history, back to our predecessors. And then the marine mollusks themselves, there are no less than 50,000 of them known and identified and probably two times more than that still unknown and, and living under the sand in, the, in, all, in all parts of the ocean. And so it was, it was difficult to figure out how to organize the book. And what I finally decided to do was to take 12 really iconic seashells that could also tell an important story. So I chose seashells that had been iconic in human history in some way. So like the chambered nautilus, which we all know really well, or Triton's trumpet, you know, obviously that was an important shell of mythology, 
but it also, you know, it's also a fascinating shell in, in all kinds of cultures, not just the Greek and Roman cultures and their, and their myths involving Triton. So I decided that that, that would be a good way in. So it kind of, in my, in my mind, I organized it around major shells, but then I also had a shape in my mind where it begins in Florida, like Florida where I live is the apex or the pointy top of the shell. But then I go around the world as, as, a, as if a shell is wound because we, you know, everything is connected to everything else. And that's so true in our environmental crises and pressures, but it's also true in, in our history and, and in our stories. So that's how I, how I tried to narrow it down was by, was by choosing those 12 shells. And that was, that was a hard decision because I did a lot of work on shells that are not in the book. I did a lot of reporting on oysters, for example. So oysters are in the book, of course, but I didn't devote a chapter to oysters because some wonderful books all their own have been written about oysters. Uh, Rowan Jacobson, Mark Kurlansky, they've written entire books about oysters. My friend David Berger, my fellow environmental journalist, wrote an entire book about razor clams. So I steered a little bit of away from shellfish to focus on iconic shells. But of course, I do get to shellfish and, and the way we eat seafood because that, that becomes an important part of the story and, and certainly an important part of the solutions to our environmental crises. As you're alluding to, the book is actually about quite a lot more than just seashells. It's right there in the subtitle, The Sound of the Sea, Seashells and the Fate of the Oceans. And you have a great line in the book referring to Triton's trumpets, where you write, The large spirals blown by the Greek god Triton to calm the seas or raise the waves are sending us a signal. So what is the signal shells are sending us? What do shells have to do with the fate of the oceans? So that is... <laughs> That is the big question, and there's not one answer to it. I think seashells really reflect humanity and what's happening to the oceans in, in a lot of ways. So there isn't just one thing that is putting pressure on marine mollusks, but I will say, you know, an important underpinning for this book is that the warming and acidifying seas are beginning to really have an impact on on marine mollusks and the, the most you know the the most obvious thing here is that marine mollusks use minerals in the surrounding environment to build their shells and they particularly use calcium carbonate and so of course the carbon dioxide we send into the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels has turned seawater some 30 percent more acidic than it was at the start of the industrial era. And this chemical change in the ocean has begun to limit the carbonate that mollusks use to make their shells. Acidic waters are also boring into some shells, pitting or eroding them. And so essentially, the acidifying oceans are, are beginning to impact shells on the other side of the climate equation for the oceans, you know the oceans have absorbed some 90% of the heat that have been that has been generated by our additional carbon emissions. And some parts of the ocean have already become too warm for mollusks. And there's a lot of new science coming out about that all the time. So, you know, some of that is in the sound of the sea. And, and that is still coming out now. And you, you will remember that just two weeks ago, when this extraordinary heat dome blanketed the Pacific Northwest, there were millions and millions of mussel shells, mussels killed on the coast in, in British Columbia and all along the Pacific Northwest coast in that, in that heat, heat dome. And that you know, that kind of picture is, is happening elsewhere in the world, too. And there, there was already some science 
uh, pointing to that issue and the fact that it would be happening more frequently. So I, you know, the two, the two big things for these mollusks and climate change are acidification and warming. But of course, there's no one, no one thing is broken. So I, I have a, I, I have a part in the book where I write, I write about uh, bouillabaisse, this seafood dish, this seafood dish that was more, I think it was a more popular, like maybe even before we were born, maybe in the 1950s. I know people still eat it, but I, I wrote about this dish of bouillabaisse and how the finest bouillabaisse had to have you know, three different kinds of fish and three different kinds of crustaceans and three different kinds of mollusks to be a really good bouillabaisse. And that to me is so telling of just how our excess has impacted the ocean. So part of it is over harvesting, right? Part of it is plastic. A big part of it is habitat loss in so many places along the coast where we have ripped out seagrass or mangroves or uh, developed too heavily on the coast. Those are those are real hot spots where you see mollusks disappearing. So basically, mollusks writ large tell the story of these pressures to the oceans and these and these complicated impacts. And so you know, there isn't one problem and there isn't one solution, but there is a way, I think, to help to help people understand and to help people live differently. So as I as I go through the book and I write a little bit more about myself in this book than I have in previous books, as I as I learn things and as I learn, for example, more about about seafood and and what's over harvested i kind of take the reader with me in my thinking about what i no longer eat or how i've changed the way i live or the way i eat and i think i think that's important to kind of go at these things with with humility and fallibility and and to say you know how how can we how can we become better together? So that's that's sort of how I approached it. So I don't think mollusks pointed to one thing, but they have pointed to the way we live and this, this world of extraordinary excess that some of us inhabit and, you know, a, a really biggie being fossil fuels, but but that's certainly not being the only issue. A good example of all this from the book is the chapter about the Queen Conch. It's got the over-harvesting, it's got the climate impacts, but you also write about conservation efforts that are underway to protect Queen Conch populations, including some initiatives to essentially reseed the oceans with the species where its population numbers have really been driven down. Can you tell us a bit about that? Sure, yeah, that's a good that's a good one to ask me about because I I happen to have visited Puerto Rico just a couple of weeks ago to do some more reporting on that story. Uh that that was one of the trips at the very end of the reporting, one of the trips I did not take was to Puerto Rico because of COVID and and I just, you know, finished up without going to Puerto Rico to see that in person, although it is in the book. So I, I've been recently and the neat thing that I wrote about in Puerto Rico, this is a Queen Conch hatchery that is being built by a, she's an American scientist named Megan Davis, who's with Florida Atlantic University, but she is working in partnership with a, um, an NGO, a local NGO in, in Puerto Rico called Conservacion Concienda. And, and that is a neat play on words because in Spanish it's conservation with science but when you listen to that word, it, it also sounds like the English word con sienda is like with consciousness. And that's a that's a lovely part of it, too. The really important thing about this work is that it's being done with fishers in Puerto Rico at the eastern point of Puerto Rico in a community, a fishing community called Naguabo. And there, there's a fishing association there 
that is partnering with, with the scientists and, and she has worked on Queen Conch aquaculture for many, many years. But the difference now is that the, the idea is to turn the aquaculture operation over to the fishers themselves. And that so often is missing in conservation stories, right? Particularly when you think about really big NGOs and the, and the work that they do at the global scale, the great conservation work that goes on, it too often leaves out small communities or, or fishers themselves. And so what's happening here is that the fishers are building the hatchery. They're being paid by you know the grant funding to build the hatchery. So the other nice thing about this is that they're not hiring so-called experts to come in and, and do the building. That is something that the community is good at. You know, there are plumbers who come in to do the piping and the fishermen are, are building various parts of it. And they're also being paid to gather the conch eggs. So, you know, the conch fishermen, uh, they, they would often, from the, time, from the time they were little, some of them were telling me they had been taught to always look under a conch to see if it had conch eggs. And they don't generally take a conch if it has eggs, or that means it's laying eggs at that time. And they normally left those alone so now they're being paid to go out and they take about a quarter of the eggs under a queen conch and a queen conch lays some 500,000 eggs. So this isn't making a, a big difference in the number of her eggs that end up surviving, but they can bring those eggs back to the lab and grow them up in the lab um, and, and grow them to whatever size. So, you know, it's, it's, you can't say exactly how this is going to work out because they're, they're only starting to bring back the eggs and grow juvenile conchs. But it's, a, but it's a very wonderful concept to imagine that the fishing association, the idea is that the fishing association will take over the hatchery once it's up and running and they've trained local people to run every aspect. So that'll be everything from growing the baby conchs to doing the marketing to, you know, selling, selling the conch meat. And the model, the model is important. I mean, in so much of this book and I, you know, so often when I read Manga Bay also, you know, you're, you're reading about, fishers who end up being some of the most vulnerable and exploited people in communities, they're the ones who know the resource very, very well. And often the, the, way, the, the way the director of Conservacion Concienda was explaining it to me, he said, you know, so often when you go to a conservation meeting and you look around the table, every single person around the table is being paid to be at that meeting from the you know from the people from the NGOs the scientists the government regulators the journalists covering the meeting everyone there is being paid except for the fisher who is there on his or her own time and you know probably struggling more than anyone else in the room and may know the resource really well, better than many of the people in the room. And it's fundamentally, it's fundamentally unfair and it, and it doesn't work on the heart of the problem, like addressing, addressing only, only the resource issue isn't getting at the solutions we need, right? Things, things aren't, aren't getting better for, for some of these animals and for the people who harvest them. So this is a neat model for how, you know, just to think about how we might do it differently. So this is, of course, on a small scale, but the idea is that this first local run hatchery goes in at Puerto Rico, and then there is an effort to have at least one in every conch habitat country. And that's 
that's 26 countries across the Caribbean. So that would be that would be a really neat model and a neat start. You've said that one of the themes you were trying to get at with the book is that we won't solve these kinds of environmental problems unless we also fix human injustices. Can you elaborate on that? That is it was kind of the conclusion of the book and it's not it's not it's not what I set out to to write or to conclude but it's sort of where the shells and the marine mollusks led me, I actually set out to listen to shells to see what story they had to tell about what's happening to the environment, about what's happening to the oceans. And by the time I finished six years later, they had much more to say about people. So in so many of these stories, which you you have gleaned a couple of these, you know, one example is the money cowrie. Um, shells were used as, as global currency. Shells were traded as money, actually longer than any coin or paper money. Human beings used shells, money cowrie specifically, as currency. And money cowries ended up purchasing some third of the enslaved Africans that were forced to the Americas. And in so many of the chapters, especially the chapters involving indigenous people like that Triton's Trumpet and and the Conk chapter in which I write about the Tayano people of the Caribbean, you know, so, so much of the history is just an extraordinary history of things like slavery and colonialism. And it really, what I could conclude by the end is that seashells had much more to say about people and how we treat one another than they even had to say about the environment. And so that ends up being the overriding, the overriding, you know, lesson and conclusion that that comes out of these shell stories is that we we won't fix our environmental problems without working on these human problems, including issues of justice and, you know, including unheard voices, bringing people to the table and all of those things. And so the, the conch story, the queen conch story is sort of a nice example of what that could look like. But when you think about you know the way the way fishing takes place all over the world and and who fishes and what long traditions they are and how poorly treated and undercompensated many fishers are you you can start to see how if we could right some of those wrongs we could really help the resource as much as the people. And so that's what, you know, that's something I hope, I hope people get out of the book. And that, and that's another thing that I think, I think we, we talk about these things and we read about them and people write papers on them and, and you hear about them in idealistic conferences and it, and it sort of doesn't get into the broader conversation. And so again, my hope is that by, by writing about seashells, I can draw people to some of these other issues of, of environmental justice and climate change and so on, you know, who, who might normally not be reading our, our work, but might really be drawn by the beauty of, or, the, or the human story of a seashell. Next up, we speak with Manila-based, manga-based staff writer Leilani Chavez, who tells us all about the incredible diversity of marine life in Philippines waters and the challenges facing the Marine Protected Area Network that has been set up to safeguard that biodiversity. But to start, I asked her to tell us about the most iconic seashells of the Philippines. The Philippines has giant clam shells, Tridacnagigas, is, uh, and it's one of the world's most endangered clam species. You know what's interesting is that in the 1970s, Um, Dr. Ed Gomez, a Filipino national scientist, conducted a study that assessed or the state of Philippine seas. And uh, in that study, he found out that 
the Philippines at that time only has three individuals of giant clamshells or tridacnagigas. So um, that, that, that 1970s study was landmark, not just in the Philippines, but in the world, because it compelled countries to look at the state of their oceans. You know, from that 1970s studies, Dr. Ed Gomez was, and the whole team at the Marine Science Institute in the Philippines were able to repopulate the whole Philippines with um, Tridacnagigas. And I, I mean, there have been various studies by experts in the Philippines and experts in the region, experts in Singapore, for example, Dr. Newlin, and of course, experts international of the contribution of giant clowns in improving the state of the oceans. So, um, so yeah, so I think that's, uh, that's one. And then, and yes, and now the the problem with the giant clams in the Philippines is there is there was a history. I mean, they they didn't. I mean, their population didn't decrease to three individuals in the nineteen seventies. If no one is harvesting them, right? So, um, there are local communities who used to eat them. There are local communities who used to get them um in the past although there are efforts to change that behavior Re but recently what we're seeing is there is a high demand for these giant clamshells because they are seen as an alternative to ivory after china banned the ivory trade in their country so it's it's sort of interconnected and complicated in that way but that that's the <laughs> that's i think that's what i could add when it comes to seashells so the Philippines has some of the highest levels of ocean life biodiversity in the world. Tell us a bit about that. The Philippines is an archipelagic country. So you could expect that we have vast marine resources. And, you know, and what's interesting is that um, international organizations have classified uh, Philippine waters as among us probably the richest in the Pacific Oral Triangle. And it's, I mean, it's not because we have a large marine area, but it's because these small areas host the highest level of species endemism. That's probably why marine scientists all over the world consider the Philippines to be among the highest, if not the highest, in not just in the region, but in the world, in terms of marine resources. But the ironic thing is that most of our policies on conservation are focused on land-based conservation or terrestrial conservation. We are an archipelagic country, but as what I've been discovering recently is that most of our programs are geared towards land-based um, conservation. What's also interesting is that uh, in recent years, we're seeing a surge in new species discoveries, not just in terrestrial areas, but also in marine areas. And I think that's very promising for gearing our existing policies towards a more science and policy and uh, observation-based approach towards marine conservation. Any particular highlights in terms of new species discoveries that you could tell us about? Well, most of what's being discovered in the Philippines recently are um, nudibranch species. Nudibranchs, which are also sometimes called sea slugs, are soft-bodied marine mollusks that shed their shell after their larval stage, so they actually live out their adulthood shellless. And uh, it's mo these are, you know, these are small <laughs> species that are often overlooked because, I don't know, I, I mean local, especially governments, don't really appreciate much on what they see underwater. Um, what they appreciate more is what they see above water. So there have been like various campaigns in recent years to focus on, you know, highlighting what can be seen underwater so that, you know, government officials could understand uh, the resources that are uh, that are within their territories. Um, as for species, I, I don't have a specific um, scientific names yet, but the, there were two new confirmed new new de branch species from uh i got it from dr terry gosliner from the department of invertebrate zoology of california academy of sciences he told me about this new confirmed species but the the interesting is, thing is that they did the study before the pandemic so they were hoping to release those new species soon
You, of course, wrote an article for Manga Bay that was published on June 30th that details the growing pressures on marine protected areas there. But you mentioned in the article that the Philippines has the third most extensive coral reef systems in the world. Yes, I, I mean, the first is, of course, the Great Barrier Reef, and then the second is Indonesia, and then the Philippines. And that, that was also, well, that wasn't a surprise for me because I grew up knowing that the Philippines has, you know, not just the best, one of the best beaches in the world, but it has really good coral reefs. Local scientists have been aware of the vastness or the richness of Philippine marine life, especially its coral reefs. And as a matter of fact, policies for conservation in the Philippines, when you talk about marine conservation, are geared towards protecting our coral reefs. And and I think what what uh, a lot of groups are doing, a lot of scientists, a lot of experts are trying to do at the moment is to expand that coverage. So you're not just covering coral reefs, but you're also covering other marine areas that are important to fish and um, to fish species or marine invertebrates. Because what I realize is that as a journalist covering marine resources requires a broader perspective compared to covering forest because in marine eco in marine ecosystems you're talking about a lot of ecosystems that are interconnected and they and if you impact if there's an impact in one area it if there's a strain in one area it impacts the whole ecosystem so when you say other areas must be protected too you mean that just protecting coral reefs isn't enough and that mangroves for instance have to be protected as well because any disturbance in any of these areas will impact the entire marine ecosystem i think what's what needs to be understood is that when it comes to marine resources it's not just about coral reefs. Although uh, previous conservation efforts in the Philippines have been heavily um, funding uh, the protection of coral reefs, actually our MPA, our Marine Protected Area Networks, are geared towards protecting coral reefs. There are recent movements in the Philippines within the science community to protect, to expand the coverage to areas to other coastal areas like seagrass beds and uh, mangrove areas. Um, because uh, according to one expert I've talked to, Dr. Rene Abisamis, who is uh, the foremost expert on marine protected areas in the Philippines, um, they have studies that show that fish species inhabit and use this uh, different marine, uh, coastal and marine ecosystems during different stages of their lives. And the Philippines is a very fish-dependent country. Fish is the source of, you know, our protein because it's cheaper. And, uh, like, we have more than 600 coastal cities and municipalities. So protecting that marine resources, the coral reefs, the mangroves, the seagrass beds, even you know the sandy bottoms are important in ensuring food sustainability and at the same time making sure that these resources could be enjoyed and could be appreciated and at the same time could be protected by future generations. I, I think it's also important to recognize that you know marine resources in the Philippines is vast, it's extensive, and it's hard to manage. So it's important that there is collaboration with the national and local governments, as well as local community engagement in sustaining marine protected areas and sustaining coastal conservation. Because just with, I mean, even though the Philippines has, let's say, fisheries policies that are comparative to that are comparable to the U.S. and Canada and, ad and other developed countries, we're not that rich. We don't have the same level of resources. So the logic of encouraging local governments to pay for conservation, for coastal conservation, is a bit of a tall order. It's a challenge, you know, to be able to sustain a conservation zone, whether that's marine or terrestrial. There has to be stable funding. And in a developing country like the Philippines, even though we have policies that are comparable to more developed countries like the U.S. or Canada, we don't have the same amount of resources allocated and prioritized for en environmental conservation. 
So I think that needs to be addressed. Another thing I learned from your article is that not only does the Philippines have a pretty extensive system of marine protected areas, but many of them are managed by local communities. Yeah, so on top of everything else, I think um, what's important to point out is in the Philippines, politics is everything because it directly impacts the management of resources. And uh, although we are a republic, there are existing laws that enables local governments to enact policies or pass ordinances that would directly Im- Im- impact the local resources. And sometimes these policies vary per area. So how does this very devolved or decentralized governance structure impact marine management? Well, what we're seeing now based on studies by local experts is that these marine protected areas aren't well managed. And there are a lot of, there's a string of reasons why, and you can't directly fault the um, local governments, for example. Like um, the current estimate on the number of marine protected areas in the Philippines falls within uh, between 1,500 to 1,600. And 90% of these areas are locally managed. When you say locally managed, these are handled by communities in partnership with the local government, the local government units. Now, in the Philippines, there are also large marine protected areas which are directly managed by the government through its uh, the Department of Na- Environment and Natural Resources. I think in most devel- in more developed countries, like for example the U.S., most of the marine protected areas are handled by the state. In the Philippines, because um, because of a long history of corruption in the political governance and the lack of um, prioritization to marine resources or to environmental issues in general, um, the responsibility of managing these marine protected areas fall under the jurisdiction of local governments. And because they have that power to protect these areas, you saw a you saw thousands of marine protected areas in the Philippines being managed by communities and local government units. And the formula that we're seeing uh, based on studies is that a well-managed protected area is number one, well-funded consistently over decades. And second, it you have a very active community and people's organization working to protect that marine protected area. I know climate change, overfishing, and illegal fishing are big threats to marine conservation there. Can you talk a bit about those threats? There are numerous threats to marine resources in the Philippines. One of them is coastal development, because as I said, you have more than 600 cities and municipalities in the Philippines, and they have to develop at some point. And I think 10 years ago, there was this massive push by the former president to go for a tourism-based approach to improving the economy. And that, that approach led to the construction of ports and airports. And, and those gateways created a, mushroom, a, mushroom, uh, a mushrooming community of restaurants and tourism facilities. So coastal development is one of the major factors that impacts uh, marine resources. That's one. The second would be the decades-old problem of illegal, uh, unregulated, and unreported fishing. Um, Yeah, and of course, overfishing. Now, those uh, illegal fishing and overfishing are interconnected in the Philippines, as well as in other countries, in a way that there has been previous policies um, by in previous years that focus on improving fish catch. So it's measuring, so the government has for decades been measuring the contribution of the fishery sector based on the total volume of fish catch. And the impact is that it pushed artisanal fisher folks and commercial vessels into adapting certain fishing gears or certain fishing activities that are detrimental or destructive to the marine habitats. I think one of the ironies when it comes to 
the fisheries management policies of the Philippines is that it's focused on more on production rather than conservation. By the time that local governments and the fisheries agencies implemented policies that ban certain policies, as certain fishing gears, there was already people within the communities have already adapted to using those fishing gears. So illegal fishing is a big problem in the Philippines. As a matter of fact, there are numerous studies by local experts and international experts that point a finger at artisanal fi the role of artisanal fisher folks or community fishers in the, degraded, the degradation of the marine environment. But what we're seeing now, because in, 2000, in 2013, the Philippines revised its fisheries code and included there a provision that requires tracking vessels. What we're seeing now with that technology is that the scale of illegal fishing that's happening within Philippine waters is not, or is, it's not the sole fault of artisanal fisher folks, but there's also a massive level of incursion being, con, uh, being done by commercial fishing vessels who enter municipal waters. Just to be clear, in the Philippines, illegal fishing isn't just in the use of certain gears, but it's also fishing in areas where you know certain ships are not allowed. Like for example, in municipalities, because of the overfished state of our seas, um, local ordinances were passed and national pol uh, policies were adopted that limited the entry of commercial fishers coming from a different municipality within another municipality. And that, al that also, in a way, limited the entry of commercial vessels within the fi 10 to 15 kilometer uh, coastal area belonging to municipalities. Now, there are, the, there are implications to those policy changes because, as I've said, in the past, the Philippines' policies when it comes to fishing has always been geared towards, you know, increasing fish production. So it doesn't matter where you fish as long as you put in the fish, right? Now that you have all these policies and different mun municipalities are implementing varying versions of those policies, you have this confusion among communities on, you know, oh, where do I fish? If I fish in this area, there are municipal commercial vessels encroaching in these areas. So the competition between artisanal fisher folks and commercial vessels is something that has been escalating in recent years in the Philippines. Your article cites research that finds only about one-third of the Philippines' marine protected areas are well-managed. But instead of going deep on that with the time we have left, why don't you tell us about some of the well-managed MPAs in the Philippines? There are quite a number of successful marine protected areas. One is the Apo Island model, which is one of the oldest in the Philippines. It's, um, it's succeeded in improving fish catch, in a sense increasing fish biomass and fish diversity, and at the same time protecting its corals. So it balances the needs of the community for livelihood and at the same time, coral conservation. So Apo Island is definitely number one when it comes to well-managed marine protected areas. The, uh, the other examples that I could think up of is the, um, the Pilar Municipal Marine Park, which is also in the central Philippines. It's being managed by uh, communities in Camotes Island. And I've been in that area. I, I visited the park. And I think what struck me the most was they were able to gain from the marine protected area when Haiyan struck in 2013. And uh, what was surprising for me is that despite the destruction that Haiyan caused in 2013, they still continued to protect that marine protected area. and. I, I guess if you look at all the successful, quote unquote, the successful or the long sustaining marine protected areas in the Philippines, they have similar things in common. And one, it's well managed. You have a very engaged and very involved local community. You have a supportive local government. What we're seeing now is there are two ingredients to a successful marine protected area 
or a well-managed marine protected area in the Philippines, the first is that you have a very engaged and very involved and very active local communities. And the second is you have a supportive local government. So aside from the Apo Island, the Pilar Municipal Marine Park, in Mindanao, you have the Del Carmen, the Kaob, uh, the Kaob Marine Protected Area. And the reason this um, protected area is one, one good example of how local governments are proactive in protecting their coastal ecosystems is because the municipality has an extensive program dedicated to protecting its mangroves. So because they are um, because they have an active community that supports the mang the protection of the mangroves, then it sort and then it also um, helps them support the marine protected area. There's a lot of well managed protected areas in Palawan, for example, and they have used the marine protected area model uh, for tourism, and uh, because. Uh, Marine protected because local communities could earn from tourism. It improved the uh, the lives of local communities. It increased their purchasing power, and at the same time, it it engage uh, it, it encouraged illegal fishers or illegal mangrove cutters to become wardens of mangroves or active players in the tourism sector. Any final thoughts you care to leave us with about the state of marine conservation in the Philippines? You know, I think it's important to recognize that ecosystems are interconnected and not just in the marine ecosystem, but also how terrestrial ecosystems, coastal ecosystems, cities, and the marine ecosystems are interconnected. Recently, there, there has been programs in Mindanao, for example, they looked at conservation knowing that you're dealing with interconnected ecosystems. They call it the, I, I, I'm not sure if you've heard, but it's called the Ridge to Reef approach, conservation approach, which um, in Mindanao, there is a city piloting a program on Ridge to Reef. And it was triggered because of the, I think a decade ago, there was a massive storm that hit the province and the, this storm caused a flash flood and that flash flood brought thousands of illegally cut timber from the forest to decimate communities. So that experience from 10 years ago compelled the city to come up with, to, to adapt a, a ridge to reef approach to conservation. So they're looking at, you know, the watershed system in the forest down to, you know, how cities are part of the whole balance and then coastal ecosystems so they have massive mangrove replantation efforts and then they're also and then further out they have uh, marine protected areas so i think it's um when you look at conservation it's important to look at ecosystems from a holistic or from an interconnected perspective i think it also helps among reporters. I mean, it also helps journalists and reporters. So um, that awareness uh, that ecosystems are connected to each other and that what happens in one area impacts another helps with uh, the types of reports, the angles of the reports, and even the perspective that these stories should be carrying when they're written or they're being reported. If you enjoy the Manga Bay Newscast, we ask that you please help spread the word by telling a friend. That's the best way to help expand our reach and keep the show growing. Another way to help is by becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com slash manga bay. We are a nonprofit news outlet. Just a dollar or more per month would really help us offset production costs and hosting fees. So if you're a fan of our audio reports from Nature's Frontline, please head to patreon.com slash manga bay to learn more and support the Manga Bay newscast. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash manga bay. You and your friend can join the listeners who've downloaded the Manga Bay newscast more than a quarter of a million times by subscribing to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. Or you can download our app for Apple and Android devices. Just search either app store for the Manga Bay Newscast app to gain fingertip access to new shows and all of our previous episodes. And, of course, you can read all of our news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline at mangabay.com. 
Or if you prefer to keep up with us on social media, follow us at facebook.com slash manga bay or on Twitter and Instagram. Our handle is at manga bay on both those platforms. Thanks as always for listening to the Manga Bay Newscast. I'm your host, Mike Gorecki, signing off. Talk to you again in two weeks. <laughs>